Hello, everybody. James here, WSI, my 70th guest. I didn't even tell you this, Eric, before we went on, but you are my 70th guest. Thank you very much for coming on. He is Eric Watts. We've been chatting for a good 20 minutes beforehand as well, so we've got to know yes, each other yeah. a bit already. <laughs> hey, and, uh, and we probably had to bleep half the things out. <laughs> yeah. It's always the thing where I always have to say, uh, you know, you may swear, and then, man, just the floodgates yeah. open. Yeah, yeah. Well, when when I was at TNA, uh, I don't know if you guys got that over t- yeah. total nonstop action, right? Yeah, we got that the pay per views. Some... We got the weekly pay per views for free. R- right, right. So, 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 you know, when I went over there, I was called by Vince Russo, and I I only knew Vince Russo based on the fact that when I was at WWE, he was the dude that sat you down and did interviews because he was a, a magazine editor. Uh, and so he did, and that's how I knew Vince. And then later on, Vince told me the story about how my father got him into booking a WWE. It was a crazy story, right? And so he, so he was, you know, W. He'd been at WCW. Now he's at TNA with Jeff Jarrett, and he calls me up and says, "Hey, I want to talk to you." I don't know him. Like I'd only, I, I had only interacted with him once in my life, and it had been, you know, ten years prior. And so he, he threw, and I was, and at that time I was, I was retiring. I did, you know, I was done with wrestling. And, you know, due to injuries. And he's the one that taught me to come back in. And he was like, hey, you know, these are, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll want to sign you to uh, two-year, 104 Wednesdays. <laughs> Every Wednesday, <laughs> I'm like, okay. I said, that, that's the lightest, rec- that's the lightest uh, uh, schedule I've ever had. I used to average around 302 days a year on the road. And, and uh, I was laughing about it. He goes, and... He goes, um, you can say anything you want because it's all pay-per-view. I said, anything? He goes, yeah. He goes, and matter of fact, the more things you can cuss about, the better. I'm like, oh, we're going to make money. <laughs> 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 we're going to make money. And, but, buddy, that, there, because there was nothing. I mean, I mean, there was some, like, you can't say GD or you can't. I mean, there's, like, one or two things you couldn't say, but there was only one or two things you couldn't say. Hmm. And so, yeah, we went off kilter, man. We, we went off at that place. So you couldn't say the uh, c word that you can't say on YouTube either. But so so there was a level of was it it was still TV fourteen though, wasn't it? More or less sort of guideline. It, 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 kind of. And listen, I never say the four letter word that starts with C because I I don't believe that there's anything I can't do. Get that one. That's good. Right? <laughs> that, ah, ah, ah. Is, is that the four letter word you're talking about? No. Yes. Um, no. 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 You. Um, that one is kind of faux pas anyway. You know, like if you want a dating life, you mm-hmm. you need to strike that. Now, when you're married, you know, and I've been married before, uh, you know, that, then it comes out. But when you're dating, that word never comes out anyway, or you'll you, you'll lose oh, you'll lose fans. That's third date stuff at the very least. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, listen, Eric. You know, just because you mentioned TNA straight off the bat, why don't you tell me about the sort of negotiations yeah. to bring you in TNA? You sort of did with Vince Russo and everything, but were you always going to be an authority figure, and was Don Callis always going to be your sort of like foil or anti-authority figure that you feud with? No, no, uh, no. Uh, this is hilarious, right? So I get a call, and and Russo's like, hey. Jeff Jarrett is, you know, Jeff was trying to pull Hulk in there for a while, right? Yeah, like yeah, he was yeah. re- like, 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 and, and there were strong discussions about bringing Hulk in. I believe at that time that they had brought Sting in. Um, they had already got Lex Luger that, you know, he was in a calm, you know, and they, they had some, they had some decent weight guys. I mean, they already had D'Lo Brown and then, and blah, 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 blah. So, so they, they, they had, but they were trying to bring in Hulk. And so, so Jeff was in between, I would say, storylines, and he's like, I want to find someone that hasn't been on TV just recently, that we're not just pulling straight off of WWE or WCW just recently, and, and I want a big guy, you know, that, that people would, they would recognize, but, they, but it's not just another name, you know, it, it, we want to kind of blow him away. And so, so Vince calls me. And I go, dude, I, I, I got to be honest with you, bro. I've never even watched TNA. And he goes, well, what? You haven't even seen the show? I said, no, I, I, I don't watch wrestling, uh, you know, anymore. I, I got two businesses. I'm busy as hell. I said, I'm good. And he goes, would you come to Nashville and watch? I go, yeah, but what's this about? He goes, Jeff wants to bring you in as the next big heel to do a, to, to do, to do a program with him 
And hopefully that will then take the period of time until Hulk Hogan comes in. I said, okay, well, I, I, I'm interested. I, I'll, I'll come watch. And, bro, they they had this little nest. You know, you could walk up in the stands. They'd take you over there. There would be about four or five guys always, like Raven and, and, and you know, uh, AJ Styles and, and just, just, just several guys would go up and watch some of the matches from way up in this nest. And um, so I went up there because I didn't want anyone to know I was there. I, I came, you know, after it started, I went up there. I didn't want anyone knowing. And I watched my chin hit the ground. I was so amazed at the talent they had there and some of the, the greatest matches I've ever seen. Now, listen, you know, there's a lot of people that don't know Jerry Lynn or didn't – Jerry Lynn was not a, a – known name like a huge name jerry lynn is one of the greatest wrestlers of all times he he is he is a franz schumann do you know franz schumann over I, there in europe I don't, right i don't okay so if you so if you ever get to interview uh, ever in your life there's an organization called catch wrestling ah, Germany, uh, Otto Vance, yeah that, that's right Otto, right so he was huge there right this this guy, man, Franz Schumann was one of the greatest wrestlers of all times. Very good friends with Chris Benoit. All these guys kind of had the same stature. Uh, Dave Taylor, mm -hmm. um, you know, from the UK. These guys, some of the greatest matches I've ever seen were Dave Taylor and Franz Schumann. Man, like like, like where you could you 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 were the only part of the match you're mad at is that it, it, that it was over. Because they, they, they were the doctors of pro wrestling, right? And, and so you'd go in there, and, and so, yeah, I knew Raven. And yeah, I knew a few of the guys. But 99% of all these guys, who in the hell was AJ Styles? I, I never heard of AJ Styles in my life, you know? And so these were your smaller wrestlers. I, I'm 6'6", 300 pounds. These were your smaller dudes. But they were going off, and, and I'm watching Jarrett and, and, and Raven. So I'm watching all these, these – um, these I'm watching all these incredible matches, not knowing ha half the people that are wrestling. And you just got that idea of it was old. It was like the old ECW where guys showed up to do whatever they were going to give their life up for their, for, for wrestling. And, and most of these guys I'm guessing aren't making anything, <laughs> you know, like literally the old, you know, the old saying of, you know, 20 bucks and a six pack. <laughs> you're doing okay. it you're doing it for the love well bro bro i know guys that would get paid off like a 20 dollars and a six pack of beer and i'm like how do you you know i so so you are doing it for the love and i sat there and it was an out-of-body experience and so i i, I went outside because i drove up with vince russo from atlanta it was me russo uh raven Disco Inferno, Sonny Siaki, and one other guy. Boom, we're up there. And I said, it's not that I want to be a part of it. I have to be a part of it. But do not tell Dixie Carter this because I am going to ask for a lot of money. But I would, I would literally wrestle here for free. That, that, that's when you're raised in pro wrestling as I was. And wrestling is what fed me every meal of my life, and it fed every one of my kids' meals. It's not just a job. It is the history of your bloodline. The Dustin Rhodes and the Dusty Rhodeses and the Cowboy Bill Wattses and the Barry Windhams, the Blackjack Mulligans and the Vaughn Ericks and the just legacy legends, legacy legends, the hearts, you know, the Lion's Den in Canada. That shit is not just talked about. That is a lifestyle that is ingrained in you. It is part of your flipping DNA. If you took my DNA right now, it would say, Bob, you know, jackass with pro wrestling in his DNA. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so it's just, it's just part of you. I had to be a part of it. Right. And so, so we go and they bring me in and literally, bro, I beat the living dog shit out of Jeff Jarrett. I mean, in the ring, out of the ring, through tables, through chairs. 
I, I even on one episode, which was kind of crazy, he wanted me to wrap a chain around his neck into a bumper, and I drug him with a car in the parking lot. Literally drug this guy. And, and, um, so, so, and then like three weeks in, four weeks in, Rusa says, Hey, uh, Jared wants to kill the, uh, angle. I go, what? He goes, he wants to go a different direction. I go, what? He goes, yeah, he didn't know you were so tall. <laughs> and so, so that was one of the most polite ways for political BS I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, well, let's see. He's me and him are WWE together. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. I, you know, I, I, I told Russo, I said, I've been 6'6 six, six since I've been 14 years old. <laughs> Jeff has known me for so long. That is the most bogus. So, so, so Jeff, I guess, somehow did not take a liking to me, which I thought we were good friends. And then he was going to put me just on the free shows. The, there was a show, I can't remember the name of it, Impact or something that they did. And, and and in the United States, they would send it out to these it, horrible ex- markets. Explosion, maybe was that it? It was Impact or Explosion or it was some something shit. like that. It yeah, was yeah. horrible. Right, right. It was in like four markets. Like three people saw it. Right. And so I, I, I told I told Russo, uh, uh, Russo I said Russo, bro, I, financially I don't need to wrestle. I, I saved all my money. I, I I got stocks, bonds, land. I don't I don't need to wrestle, bro. I said I was you know I, you called me. He goes. You can't quit. I go, the hell I can't quit. I said, this is no big deal to me, brother. I don't want to be somewhere I don't want to be. I mean, that that I'm not wanted. I said, I've dealt with all the politics, the WCW, WWE. I've dealt with all the politics, bro. I'm past the politics. I'm good. I'm good. He goes, you got to do this. Now, now, Jeff and Vince Russo are best friends. But it was the oddest relationship I ever saw because Russo would love to mess with Jared. <laughs> It was hilarious. And so I'm like, so what do you want me to do? He goes, I don't know, bro. He goes, let me ask you something. He goes, how good are you on the mic? I go, honest? He goes, I've never heard you on the mic. I go, okay. I said, let me put it to you this way. There is only one guy that is good as me on the mic, and he is a far second. And he goes, who's that? I go, The Rock. <laughs> and he just, he just busted out. He popped. He laughed. He's like, you got to be kidding me. And I said, no, I got to be honest with you. Not, no one's really let me get on the mic and be me. But in my head, I know I could be very good. And he goes, that's all I need to hear. He goes, we're going to get you into something where you are like talking and going off. I said, I'd love it. So, so now they demote me to this impact or whatever the heck you were thinking, right? And, and what they would do is, they would they would have one or two of those matches before the actual pay per view happened, and then I think they did one match after whatever, and that's what was Impact, and they shipped it off and you know did it right. So the next two or three weeks, or four weeks or five weeks, I can't tell you how long it is. I'm showing up, and I I know that they're just like they don't care who I wrestle, what I do. So now I just turn into a character of this self absorbed ass which I'm so good at. And so I started turning everything into what's. What's up? What's wrong? What's your problem? What's he going to do about it? This is not DNA. This is what's world, you know? And, and, and so all of a sudden, and, they, and, they, and, they, and so I'm still a heel, which I've never been really able to be other than ECW, a heel. And I was only in ECW for a short period of time. And I'm digging it. But now the fans are going absolutely berserk about me and i'm saying like in a two three four week period of time to the point where russo said he was sitting back with jeff and jeff goes oh shit he goes we haven't gone over you know well you know what interviews do i have tonight what matches goes, the show just went on and russo goes the show hasn't started yet because they would start that show with that old you know the the, the wrestling thing you know the 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 statue of the wrestlers yeah like yeah, the, yeah 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 the, the, the Greek Roman wrestlers yeah. and, and, the, and the music and stuff and the people would go ape crazy. And then you'd see the dancers in the cage and all this other stuff and they'd be going crazy. He goes, he goes that's not the show. He goes, that's, that's Eric Watts. That's his entrance. And Jeff goes, oh, shit. There, there's no, now, from what I heard, this is his words. He goes, there's no one that over. 
And he goes, well, then you need to maybe step out and watch because, Jeff, it's every week, this kid. He goes, every week it's like this. And so he went out and watched. He goes, what in the hell are we doing, Vince? Why is he on the show? He goes, you demoted him and told me to put him on the show, right? Well, during that time, I'm doing all this. So now he sees me working on the mic. And, he, and Vince Russo is actually the one that came up with the idea. I was – I was having a tough time at home with my wife and, and we were headed to a divorce after 15 years of marriage. And, and so, and I was telling Russo, well, the one thing you never tell Russo is anything because Russo is Russo's always been famous for taking real things in your life and putting them on TV, which he said, Eric, but then you can be in touch with it. So now all of a sudden he's like, Hey, what we're going to do is, you know, because you know, <laughs> We did get into a brutal battle in court. It ended up going five years, but I mean, her lawyers froze my assets. My lawyers at one time froze her assets. We had we had restraining orders against each other. I mean, this was a high level five year in court divorce. So I said, this, and, you know, because I used to say, well, this chick is going to break me, or, you know, blah blah blah. Well, so he came up with this idea because th- because then he 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 does the the director of authority. Then has Goldilocks kind of going out, coming out with me. I said, bro, are you ribbing me? He was like, what? I go, you're just adding fuel to the fire. He goes, for what? I go, I'm going to go, I'm going through a divorce. Now you've got me with this chick. And he was like, is your wife upset? I go, yeah. So then all of a sudden, so he gets deeper. Like we're definitely like doing innuendos. Like we're having sex. Like one time it was me, her and Trinity. And she was interviewing me. And I can't, I can't remember. Oh, I, I said, and she goes, and, and, um, Hey Eric, I got Trinity. And I said, yes. And I'm so excited about the experiment. So I started calling it the, the experiment, right? Like the threesome was going to be an experiment. Right. And so I'm doing all this other stuff. Well, I am coming home and my wife is going off on me. Well, Vince goes, that's perfect. And so we, we do it. So then, so that, then I bring in some high line, uh, entertainers that are my friends, trick pony, you know, the country artists. So they show me. So I called up my boys. I said, Hey, the next time you have a concert, can I come and like move some of the sound equipment and get you guys water on stage? So they came and filled me like giving them water that I was a stage hand that I was just working for a place to stay. Like they had me staying in the bus, you know, then I brought in one of my good friends that was one of the best linebackers of all time, Brian Erlacher for Chicago bears. He came. So all these people are coming in and they're playing this, the story, like I'm broke. My wife has left me. She's filed for divorce and she's frozen all my assets, which was, it was kind of a shoot. <laughs> right. So, so then, and the fun, here's the funny thing. We ended up almost getting back together because he, through all this other stuff, I'm like, Vince, she literally is going off. And he's just laughing his ass off. He goes, well, great. And he goes, does she know how to wrestle? I go, no, she does not know how to wrestle. He goes, well, let's put her on the show. I'll get you guys back together because I'll have her just come and beat up Goldilocks. And I'm like, she would love that. Well, so they have her two weeks in a row on pay-per-view. She comes in and just beats the piss out of Goldilocks in two different matches, jumps up. So now, now me and her are hanging out. She's digging me again. How crazy. I mean, this is true life to form. That's how Vince had me there. The crazy thing about the Don Callis deal and again, let's be very careful with this. This is hearsay. Okay. So now, now I'm the director of authority, and I am just cr- crushing it. I mean, by far, and by far, I am the most popular talent on the roster. Bigger than Jared's, bigger than than Lex, bigger than bigger than anyone else on the card. When I came out, that place. It was like Goldberg when he was in his heyday or Undertaker. Literally, you could not hear yourself when I came out. And it didn't matter what I said. Everyone laughed their ass off. <laughs> I could have said the dumb. They, they, they were just there. So, so here we are, and we're rocking and rolling. And of all things, I heard that Dusty Rhodes liked my director of authority so much that he goes, wait. I don't want to wrestle that much anymore. That's the perfect role for me. So that's when last second they had Don Callis, which again was a rib. 
because Don Callis had not wrestled in I don't know how many years. I mean, like, like, like forever. He even told me. And they made us main event. And they knew the match was going to flop. They wanted – here's what they wanted. Jeff wanted the match to flop. He wanted it to go down as one of the worst matches ever. And he, and he wanted me to lose the director of authority title all in one night. Don Callis was so freaked out. He came to me and goes, Eric, I haven't wrestled in so long. He goes, I'm not in shape. I didn't know. Because they didn't like, – it wasn't like the week before, two weeks before they told us what was going to happen. We just show up and they go, hey, by the way, you're going to have a match, main event with Don Callis. It's going to go like 20 minutes. But I'm like, what? I didn't even know Don wrestled. <laughs> so we go out, have a match. I put over a guy that I do not think has ever won a match in his life. I'm the most popular person they've got. And I put them over and lose my title because of, from what I understand, Dusty Rhodes wanted to be a director of authority. So then I lose it. He gets it. Um, then, then at the end, what ends up happening is DDP comes in and Raven's there and, and me and DDP – Raven actually came up with an idea, which was kind of crazy, is that uh, Dallas and me were best friends, which that's not crazy. Me and Dallas are great friends. You know, D Dallas is probably my best friend in the world. Um, and But that's some bitch has so many people that call him best friend. I I, I might be number 99, <laughs> uh, but he's, he's probably number one. And, um, and literally comes up with an idea like, hey, why don't we have this – why don't we have this angle that he slept with your wife? And, you know, I'm like, well, I don't really want to do that angle. And I was like, no, oh, that, that's good. That's good. So we'll do it. And then what will end up happening he was because when as I come in, I want to work with Eric Watts. Dallas, Dallas, Diamond Dallas Page is coming in to TNA and says, they go, who do you want to work with? He goes, Eric Watts. Not Jeff Jarrett, not Sting, not Hogan, not no one. I want to work with Eric Watts, right? And um, and so I we did that, and I had a match with Raven. I beat Raven, and we're going to go into me and Dallas's uh, thing. And at that time, I had to leave TNA because my divorce was finalizing. And my lawyer said, you need to get out of your contract as soon as possible, or that will be held against you when it comes to alimony and child support and shit like that. So I literally called Dixie Carter. And said, ma'am, I'm sorry. And she goes, Eric, but you got X number of this and you got X number of dollars left on your agreement. And please don't leave us, but I understand. And da da da, we'll do. Let us just send you a check for the full amount. That's how thankful we are for you. And I go, I can't even, I, I don't want one more payment. So not only did I leave, I left with the remainder on my agreement, which they were going to give me in full out of respect for what I did there, I guess. And I, I turned it down just for the bartering of the alimony and child support in my divorce decree. And, and, and that's, that's what ended my wrestling. Amazing. I, do you know what's also amazing, right? I asked you one question, and we're 23 minutes in, and I feel silly now for doing five pages worth of research on you. <laughs> I, well, I mean, I only have one question in me, so we're done. <laughs> Good night, everybody. No. Hey, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, listen, Matt, uh, do, do you know, if I knew how great of a talk, and you are a great talker, I, if I knew how great of a talker, well, I would have saved myself three hours doing the research. We just had like three questions to do that. Listen, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take uh, I'm going to take you to uh, WCW. You knew we were going to do some WCW stuff. And but I don't know, maybe you've not been asked this before, is uh, obviously you go to uh, training, uh, power plant or whatever it was called back then. What was the yep. first time when you went to WCW that someone sat down with you and said, right, Eric, this is what's going to be happening. You're going to be facing these guys. You're going to be on TV on this date. When was like the first like uh, briefing session uh, of what your career was going to be like? Never. Right? <laughs> never. No, no, I mean, I mean, serious, never. This is what happened is I, my mother had made a deal with my father that no child was to step foot in the ring without a college degree because my mother did not have her college degree. My mother is from Estonia. Um, Rush had come to Estonia and said, hey, let us put some tanks and some, you know, there, you know, to ward off anyone that may want to come and, and, and get in war with you guys. 
and and but and we'll be cool and we'll just we'll just leave some of our equipment here and they're like eh, okay and they rolled it in and they turned it on and said nope you're ours now and and my mother's parents were well-off people they, uh, they own like the telephone company the post office a leather uh refinery they have a county named after them sorrow county is in, in estonia so that they, they took their their jewelry and they snuck out uh, on on their on their getting out they were actually in a milk truck now people think no like a milk no like like horse and carriage milk <laughs> Right, and they stopped him at a a a uh, Check, police checkpoint. Yeah, yeah. That point, they heard someone cough or something in the thing, and the father came out, and they were so excited that they that they caught him. They did not check the truck. So, so three sisters and a brother and the mother got through on the milk truck. They bartered with a a guy that had been hit in one of the wars a hole in his ship. He goes, I'll take you as far as I can, but we're going to stay near the coast because I don't know how far the boat will go. And they made it to Germany. So in Germany, they were put in concentration camps, which were then deportation camps. They, they were seven years over there. So my mom came over knowing nine languages, got one of the most beautiful women you've ever seen in your life. And she, so she goes into high school and, you know, being a maid and doing these things, right? Because, you know, not everyone spoke, perfect english and working her butt off then becomes a model and uh, with miss america bandstand and all this other stuff in america well my father he played college football in oklahoma then he got drafted to the houston oilers but but he didn't finish his college career at oklahoma either because he went to go play pro football and so then he was playing pro football and then when he was when he was wrestling for vince mcmahon senior at WWF, that's what it was called way back in the day. He was going through downtown New York and looked up at a billboard, saw this beautiful model, and it was my mom. Him and my mom dated in high school. So he looked up the advertising agency, got a hold of my mom, and that's how they started dating. But neither one of them had a college degree. And so now you think about it, they, they've got all these friends because back in the day, there's like 23 territories. So, you you know, you've got the Ganyas, AWA, you've got the Grams down there, the Sunshine Network in Florida. You got the Von Erics in Texas. You got the people in Seattle. You got the, the Hearts in Canada. So you've got all these federations. And my father knew all these people. And she goes, Bill, out of all these people who even has a college degree. So, it, it, so, so now... So what wrestlers were famous for were getting their kids into wrestling at 14, 15, 16 years old, either being a referee or whatever. Some of these guys had wrestled, started wrestling at 16, 17 years old. And my mom's like, I don't want that for our kids. I don't, I, I, you know, if, if they break something or if something doesn't work out, I need them to fall back. So we were mandated not to get in the ring. We did everything. We set up rings. We did the we did the sound, the lights, the cameras, security, ticket sales, merch. We were one hundred percent a part of pro wrestling at all times. We could not get in the ring. I did not know how guys called matches. I did not speak Carney. I didn't know anything when it came to that. My dad was so old school. Bad guys, good guys. They didn't ride together. They didn't room together. They didn't travel together. Can I ask you, sorry to interrupt, with with your dad, oh, Bill, is, uh, did he ever, I, I hate to use the uh, uh, words, you know, the insider terms, but I can't think of anywhere else to say it. Did he smarten you up as a kid to wrestling, or were you always sort of kayfabe, basically? My mom smartened me up when I was about 15, and she said, do not tell your father I told you. Oh, really? Because our thing was, as kids, my dad said, anyone, anyone, you go out or you go anywhere and someone says, is wrestling real? Before they get the L on it, I want you to pummel their brains out. So literally he goes, and I don't give a shit if it's your best friend. Beat them like they stole your money and no one will ever ask you. So we were running under the fact that it was real. And I remember times where my dad, where I would have some friends that I would bring to a show and I would go to the security, but I'd set them up. And afterwards we may come down and go to the babyface locker 
And I, and I remember Terry Taylor sitting there one day, just his head bandaged up. And I had like three or four of my friends. There was a guy named Brian Ketchum, one of my, my lifetime best friends, and da-da-da. And they're just like, they're just so excited. They're meeting all the wrestlers and all this other stuff. And my dad said, you guys, you know, let me explain something to you. You want to know whether this is real or fake? And, of course, no one asked. So my dad just sit there and, boom, rips off Terry's uh, bandage and just gaps his head. And his blood starts rushing it. And my dad goes, does that look fake? Does that look <laughs> this man took a, you know, this man took a beating, blah, blah, blah. Go bandage your shit up. You know, that, that's how brutal my dad was, right? And and um, now later on, um, it was brutal because it was either Buzz Sawyer or someone got lit up by Skandar Akbar with fire. Um, or maybe it was Hacksaw Jim Dogan. I can't remember. Literally, literally, they took their fingers and twisted his face. And then my dad had a, uh, he took a brick and put sandpaper and sanded his face. Sanded it. Like the skin would get caught on the sandpaper because it, because it's oily. And then you'd have to turn it over and get more sand. Just to rub as much of your skin off your face so that people knew he got burned. I mean, it was just heavily crazy. So when my mom told me, she goes, you don't tell your father shit, you know, but I'm going to let you know so you're not freaking out all the time. Because, some, I mean, you know, for us back in the back, man, it was still kind of, it was intense down there. We saw some crazy matches. My, my dad had the toughest territory, and I'm not dogging anyone else's territory, but people to this day even say, if you took all the territories and put them together, Cowboy Bill Watts' territory could beat up all 22 other territories at once. <laughs> because, I mean, you know, Dr. Death Steve Williams, Rick Steiner, uh, Buzz Sawyer, Hacksaw, Hacksaw Jim Dugan was like a legend. Steve Dr. Death Williams was a legend in the streets fighting. Hercules. Uh, Dirty Dick, Hercules, Dirty Dick Slater was known for knocking out a few NFLers. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like, like my dad had one rule. He goes, you guys can go out and party and do all you want. If you ever get beat up in a fight, and he goes, I don't care whether it's versus one person or 50 people, you're fired. Like, like, like he wanted his guys to be revered and feared, right? So with all that being said, so here I am, I'm playing college ball. I've got an agent. It looks like I'm going to either go to Cincinnati Bengals or Tampa, Tampa Bay in the low, low rounds. In the low rounds. I, listen, bro. I ain't here to make a bull for you. I'm not like I'm. I'm not saying I'm a first rounder. The guy before me, the guy before, two guys before me was Jay Gruden. Jay Gruden. I don't know if you ever heard of John Gruden and Jay Gruden, the NFL coaches. No, no. Jay Gruden was Washington Redskins. His brother, his his brother John Gruden, is the guy that got fired um, from the Las uh, Vegas Raiders two or three years ago, and he had a 10-year, $100 million contract, okay? So Jay was the quarterback before me. He went to Arena Bowl and set all these records. The quarterback right before me was a guy named Browning Nagel, and he went uh, quarterback first round, I mean, second round to New York Jets. So I was sitting in a stable of people. So by the time I got to play, I didn't, I, I didn't play four years like a lot of guys that get drafted are, you know? So I knew I was going to go late rounds. And, and so I had called up my father that was in Oklahoma. I was like, Hey dad, is there anything, is there anything around here? You know, is there, you know, in Louisville and Tennessee, whatever, where I could get in a ring. I said, you know, I've graduated and I just kind of want to see what it's like to get in the ring, man. And he's like, well, a very good friend of mine, one of the masked assassins, Jody Hamilton has a school South, of um, Atlanta in Jonesboro. Now, people call the power plant. We're talking before the power plant, all right? If the power if the power plant is a penthouse, I don't know if you guys over there across the pond have trailer parks. Not really, <laughs> but I, I imagine it's like the outhouse kind of thing, the penthouse and the outhouse. Okay, <laughs> okay, there you go. Very <laughs> good. This is the outhouse. So I said, I said, cool. So I got in my car. I had some days off before my school and uh, about a month off. And I drove down there and and Jody and a guy named Sarge. Sarge is legendary with WCW as one of the toughest, brutal trainers. I just talked to Sarge just the other day and um, sent me down there. And, and the only insight he gave me is like, he was like, let me, let me give you a heads up. You know, these guys are used to taking guys. Everyone wants to be a wrestler and they beat the piss out of them. He said, so make sure you can do like five, five, 6,000 squats, 
Make sure you can do a thousand or two uh, push-ups, thousand two sit-ups, because they're going to sit there and put you through the regimen. And then what they like to do is then put you in in the ring and you know abuse the shit out of you. And he goes, because we got all these bodybuilders and these pro football players and people in Atlanta that are coming to try out, and and we want them to leave beat up so they go tell other people that this is not to mess with. Well, I was a big time amateur wrestler anyway, you know, my whole life. So I'm like, okay, so. I was in good shape anyway. So I do the Hindu squats and all the stuff that I would normally do, but I added to them. And so I, I so I went down there and I, I started working those guys. Like, oh my God, I, you know, I'm cramping. And uh, 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 they got me in the ring and they were going to make me look bad. And I beat the living shit, choked them <laughs> out, you know? So, that, so, so, so I get in there and then Jody loved me. And, and back then, man, there was probably only six, seven people. I, I, El Gante or whatever. They had this, this guy, I think he was Hispanic or something, like 7'2". They were going to make, you know, one of the new giants. They had these guys named the Cole Twins. They, they did yeah. – they, they were really good look, – yeah, good-looking guys. I love those guys. Um, uh, they were working out there. Uh, but, I, but, but, real, but realistically, no real, real big names were down there. And, and so I went there, and I worked out. And, and bro, I would meet them at 8 a.m., and we would leave that place at like 6 p.m. Literally. I would be bleeding. Those ropes cut me open every day. I mean, the worst part of wrestling when you work with WCW is the ropes are completely different. Like at WWE, the ropes are rope. At, at, w, at, at, at WCW, they're like phone lines that are taped. So they have a piece of steel through them. Is it like and rubber? So, is it like a rubber casing round the round the steel well, cable? It's, it, it's rubber or tape. A lot of times they would just tape, but but sometimes they would put yes, they would put a hard plastic around it, and then sometimes they tape it. But literally, so if you think about this, in order to make those stretch just a little bit, you've got to hit them full speed because if you don't, you they won't move. They literally won't move. And that's why if people go back and watch WCW and see these guys popping off the ropes. Just that is torture. It is just torture. So even to this day, I've got like a scaly side of my body because you hit it with your right side. Bro, the first probably two weeks, blood all down my socks, all just, 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 I was just profusely bleeding the whole time. So if you can imagine, so now I'm wrestling there. So now I got to go back to college, right? Because I need to finish up a few things and, um, and so here I am, and I go, and Dusty Rhodes says, hey, bro, he goes, how would you like to get in front of an audience one time? I said, baby, I, I, I want to do that so bad. I said, sir, I said, if you just, if you don't mind, I'm going to go finish up school. And I said, I'm going to come back. I, I'd, I'd like to get, take a shot at maybe pro wrestling. He goes, why don't you do this? You're going back to Louisville from Atlanta. We got a show in Cleveland, Tennessee. And he goes, and what we'll do is we'll just give you a match with Sarge. Well, now, now think about this. At first, it sounds okay, but I've only been in the ring 21 days. Bro, I don't know how to throw a punch. <laughs> um, I, I mean, because as an amateur wrestler and because I watched wrestling my whole life, we knew some stuff, and Sarge would call the stuff, and I knew Carney by then. I could speak Carney and all these other things. But, but there was a lot I could not do. And so I said, sure. And so I went and did that. So afterwards, Grizzly Smith said, hey, Dusty wants to talk to you. Called Dusty. I was like, hey, I heard you did pretty good. I said, sir, I don't even remember the match. <laughs> like, like, it was such a blur. You know, it was, it was, it was such a blur. And so, um, which is kind of funny, because when I got there, I went into the, the good guy's locker room, and there's Rick Steiner, which has known me since I've been 14 years old. He goes, what the F are you doing? I said, well, I'm having a match. He goes, they're going to let you have a match? I go, yeah. He goes, there goes the business. He goes, where did you, where did you even train? I go, I trained for 21 days. He goes, oh, 21 days. I go, well, sir. I was, he, he goes, get out of here. I had to dress in the concession stand. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Old ladies are doing popcorn. I've got, I've got a towel over my wanker. I'm putting on my pads and stuff. People are going, hey, I'd like a, a popcorn. I'm sitting there getting dressed, bro. And, and, and so I left and came in. And then when I left, I came back to the concession stand. <laughs> it was ridiculous. But anyway, so, so after that, he goes, hey, Eric, we're wrestling in Knoxville tomorrow. You want to run that match back? And um, I said, I said, no. I said, yeah, I would love to. 
um, run it back. I said, I might actually remember it. So we went and I wrestled then. And then I think the third night, it was in Nashville or something. And uh, Dusty again said, hey, you want to? I said, sure. Yeah, I'd, lo- I'd love it. I-, I remember I had a blast, blah, blah, blah. So after that night, I was leaving to go. Now I'm done, right? I, I do the three little stits. I know everyone's going back because they have Saturday Night Live in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And, 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 you know, so I know they're doing the TV. I, so I was asked to call Dream. And Dusty goes, how was it? I go, dude, there's nothing like it. I said, I've at that point, man, I have played and sold out. My first start game to start was Ohio State. I think there was like 108,000 fans at their stadium on ESPN was my first college football start. I had, at that point, played football in Tokyo, Japan, at the Coca-Cola Classic, Louisville versus Syracuse. I had been on some pretty big platforms in my life. And I said, there's nothing like it. I said, I cannot, I cannot tell you what they drown. And he goes, these exact words, he goes, I knew it. You're fucked. I go, sir. <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, once you feel it, son, um, he goes, once, once you feel it, there's no high, no drug, no sex, no, no, there's no high that you'll ever be able to get to emulate the feeling of being in there and thrilling the fans. And I said, you're right. I said, let me finish my master's. I got three classes. I'll be back in three months to train and I hope you can try out. He goes, you're never going to go back to school. I said, sir. I said, my fiance is back there. She's finishing up her college too. I said, I got to go back. I said, you know, I, I, I've already, I've already done interviews with Georgia Pacific downtown Atlanta so I could get a job and I can work out after the job. He goes, no, no, no. Your fourth match is on Saturday night live WCW and we've got a contract. So, so I then go, oh shit, like what? Well, this is this is getting real. So I call my wife and me or my fiance at the time. Immediately, she drives down to meet me in Atlanta to go to the show. And bro, we're sitting in a hotel, and I don't even know what I'm going to wear. So I told her, I said, bring some of my football pants. So I cut off my football pants. I wore my letter jacket because the Steiners used to wear their letter jacket. You, you cannot imagine how weird this was. She's like, well, I've been watching wrestling. The guys don't have hair. I go, what? They're like, yeah. None of the, I go, what are you talking about? She goes, you don't have to shave. I go, shave what? And she was <laughs> like, your body. I go, dude. So I'm like, okay, well, I'll just do the bottom part. So I do it. And I'm like, oh, that looks horrible. You know? So now we're doing this. Then she's like, oh, uh, you got to do the night before, we're sitting there shaving me, and I'm freaking out like I'm some chick going to the prom. Like, oh <laughs> no, you know, but like, like I'm not going to shave my forearms, you know. And then you look at yourself, and so we're doing that stuff. We're trying to figure out what I'm going to wear on TV. It was horrible. So then the next thing you know, the first year is over. I wrestled over 305 matches. I was voted by the public. 1992 Pro Wrestling Illustrated Rookie of the Year with only having three months or four months of that year that I wrestled. I didn't wrestle the whole year. It was a blur. So there was no, hey, Eric, we got this idea for you. Hey, Eric. The only idea they said is what we're going to do is we're going to have you follow Dustin and, and Barry Windham around and, you, you know, kind of like a second generation gimmick, you know, for a while. But, bro, Nothing was talked about. I didn't even know where I was going to buy a house or or or, or get an apartment. I, I called Sting up and I said, Sting, because Sting had known me since I was 14. I said, bro, where until I find out where I want to buy a house, where should I live? He goes, I got two gyms. Me and Lex have two gyms. There's one on Windy Hill Road. He goes, the beautiful thing about Windy Hill Road, you never have to get on to 75. You can go to the outer loop to the airport and you can be back and you can walk from this really nice gated place. We made a special exit because only chiropractors – uh, 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 Atlanta Braves, successful doctors, and strippers live there. I go, <laughs> okay. But I want to, let me tell you what. You sold me at the chiropractors. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it, didn't matter, it didn't matter what day of the week you went to the pool. You did not want to leave the pool. Let's just say it. And, and, and so, and so, um, so, dude, I, I did exactly what Steve said. And he said, hey, you know, you can have a free membership. You and your wife, you know, I've known you forever, blah, blah, blah. And here I am talking to you. 
that's what happened in my wrestling world. That's <laughs> that's what happened in my wrestling life. And then all of a sudden, I'm I'm, I'm talking to you. <laughs> I've I've got to ask you, you know, your first like uh, on screen sort of proper feud with a big star, and you've only got as you say weeks or a couple of months of practice doing this thing, and you're staring face to face with Rick Rude. For, what was it? The yeah. US title at the time. You must. I yes. mean, I mean, you were saying like, there's nothing like it, and I don't know how much pressure you felt, especially you know being with a big star. But you know, being away from Rick Rude, you must have been like, oh god, I'm in the big time already. Well, not okay. So, so, so let's let let's roll with this one. Rick Rude hated my father, and my father hated Rick Rude. <laughs> and Good. and and he did and he did not hate Rick Rude the character he did not hate rick rude the wrestler because rick rude should be and is one of the greatest wrestlers of all times so 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 his work his work ethic in the ring was incredible his personality was rick rude like like rude he was just a rude individual right uh he thought he was the best he knew he's the best and everyone else kissed his ass I mean, I don't care who it was. Hogan, Sting, Steiner, no, no. He was just, eh, you know, everyone was just, you know, peons, right? So here I am. Now my dad is the president of WCW. I've got a freaking agreement with him. I already have so much heat just coming to the first show. The funniest rumor was this. When I was a freshman or sophomore, I can't remember. No, freshman. When I was a freshman at college, Somehow my father met a person in which gave him a great deal on my Trans Am and then gave me a, a and then gave me a great deal on a trade-in and gave me an insane price to purchase a Porsche 944 Turbo. So my freshman year, I and it was Louisville Cardinal Red, the Porsche was, just so you know, okay. So so this is before the NIL deals, right? So I'm there at quarterback in Louisville. I'm driving a red Porsche 944 Turbo, and it is just pimp time. I mean, we, I mean, you know, just life is good. I had so much heat that people were saying that my first year contract was like a million dollars that I had negotiated and that I demanded a signing bonus of a, of a Porsche. And I'm, I, okay. Okay. Now, but here's the funny thing about it is I'm like, these people are so pissed off at who I am. Who in the hell would go to Ted Turner and say, Hey, I need a million dollars. And can you give me like a four year old Porsche as a signing bonus? I mean, you know, so they didn't even know the year of the Porsche. They were just adding the Porsche into the mix too. They hate me so bad. So you add all of this up and then you tell Rudy's got to do a freaking He's got to do a freaking angle with me. The Rick Rude, he was not happy. Like, 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 like Rick Rude was not happy at all. And believe it or not, back then, we would tape like three or four shows. This is before the Raw Wars and the Thunder Wars and the live TV. Everything was pre-recorded. And so I remember that first night that I got there, I found out that I was wrestling Rude. I was in wrestling rude once, three times, three times that day. I think I think we were match like we were match like fifteen, thirty two, and like sixty four, like literally. So so a that's a very long night, mm. right? I mean that's a lot, and and then to have to wrestle a guy that is totally pissed off. He was uh, he like like when he blew snot on my back. And he spit on me, and that, that was shoot like he was pissed, right? Um, but later on, me and Rude got into it pretty big, and um, I kind of handled him a little bit. And all of a sudden, all the boys in the locker room said, "Dang, <laughs> you know the this Watts kid. <laughs> uh, don't mess with him, type of thing, you know." And that as soon as that day happened uh, in front of everybody, which was a big blow to him, he went from my hating me more than life to becoming one of the best mentors I had in pro wrestling. He literally, he would say, Hey, you know, I'm going to ask if we can do a few shots. And then, and then, and then in, in the towns, he would come up to me and say, hey, I'm going to watch your match. And afterwards find your way over to the heel locker room. And he would go over my matches and what I could have done better and what I could have, 
you know, and then and then every once in a while he'd go up and say, hey, can I have a match with Eric? And he would talk to me the whole time. Hey, that's good. But less with the audience. Hey, that, he was like, he was gold. But I, but I was very blessed, bro. I mean, Steamboat did the same thing to me. Raven did it over and over. Arn Anderson. Bobby Fulton was was like a godsend. So I had all those people. And when I went to WWE, as soon as I went to WWE, Bret Hart and Owen Hart pulled me aside and said, hey, Eric, nice to meet you. And I'd never met him, right? But because the, our fathers knew each other so well, they said, hey, you understand that you're pro wrestling. This is in our DNA. I said, yeah, they go, your problems are our problems. So you come to us if anyone's fucking with you. We'll take care of it. And I was like, ooh. You know, like at WWE, you're talking about Bret Hart, no one Hart, right? I never went to him. I always kept shut up no matter what the problems were. Um, Undertaker did the same thing. Now, now, he wasn't generational, but Undertaker, he pulled me and said, bro, you know, I got you, da da da. So, so even those guys had seen how much heat I got, and they're like, "We do not understand how you haven't cracked the 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 ribs and the shit that would go on." Was cool. Uh, I I would I need to write a book. I mean, I need to write a book. It was that bad. Oh, I wrote a book, and I haven't got it to okay. show you. Do you know, just because you've just mentioned that, one sec. It's here. Uh, There we go. Sorry, I never do that, but I actually wrote yeah. a book on Owen Hart, King of Pranks. So there you go. There's a, I think it was, I've cataloged something like 160 or something. <laughs> and, and let me tell you what, he is awesome. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, two other guys that were off the chain, uh, both the nasty boys. <laughs> they, 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 well, I, one day I, I had, I had uh, talked to Sting. I said, hey, bro, can I ride on the road with you? He goes, Eric, he goes, the heat you have. He goes, yeah, we got a seven-day tour. It's down. It's up the East Coast. We're driving to most of the places. So what I'll do is you'll leave your car. I'll pick you up, but then people can't see you. So I'm going to drop you off at a separate hotel. Da, da, da. I don't want the heat on you. Uh, you don't need any more heat riding around with me. So we'd leave the buildings, or I'd go walk somewhere. He'd pick me up. I mean, literally, like, on, on the kayfabe, I was riding with, with Sting. And one night, we were, like, in Norfolk, Virginia, or somewhere. I can't remember where we were at. And Sting goes, come on, man. Let's go. You know, because I waited till the very end. And I go, you're not going to believe this. I can't find my bag. I was in my wrestling chair. I'm like, I can't find my bag. I can't find anything. And then someone came in, and we're looking, looking. They had, they knew how to like pull the locks off these lockers, like locks. They had, they had taken my, my jeans because you go like on 10 days, right? Mm-hmm. So they took all my jeans and stuck locks on every loop of my <laughs> jeans. But then somehow they got up 20 feet into the ceilings and they chained my bag to the rafters. So <laughs> we had to call, we had to call the fire department. To come to the show afterwards, cut my bag down from the ceiling. So the next day, we've got a flight. Well, bro, back then, I couldn't get to a fucking metal detector. I had all these jeans and locks <laughs> on them. You know, so when they look at myself, like, what happened? Like, it's a long story. So the next town I went to, I literally had to go buy cutters and cut all the locks off my jeans. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This one's going to be a pretty quick one. Then we'll get into our first game. It's probably going to be our only game, actually. But uh, we'll get into our first game. But I must ask you this. Obviously, yeah. you're feuding with a bit of uh, the Dangerous Alliance and Paul Heyman, or poorly dangerously at this point. Yeah, yeah. I happen to be reading. I was researching this script for you today. And Paul Heyman's exit from WCW is one of the more interesting exits in WCW history. Do you remember uh, why? From what I remember is my dad had caught him cheating on his uh, turning in of uh, car rental receipts and stuff and, bu- and busting his ass. And um, they had huge heat from that day after. My dad, my dad said, this, this is from my dad. Me and my dad didn't talk all the time, right? He, you know, he's Cowboy Bill Watts. I mean, as tough as you see him on TV, that's how he is as a parent and a father. He. Yeah, even to this day, you know, some days we talk and some days we don't. He's he's just as he's a hard, hard nut, right? And he just sat there and said, "What an idiot! What a ho-. he said, what a horrible business person to give up and to give up a contract that you're making six figures for for rental car receipts." He goes, "Blows my mind." He goes, and he is 
by far one of the most talented guys on the mic. And he goes, Eric, he's incredible with his booking knowledge in his brain. He goes, this guy is a genius and he's going to lose his job for being a thief. He goes, and I hate liars and I hate thieves. I was like, whoa. So, so Paul always treated me awesome. Paul always loved me. Matter of fact, you know, there's several guys go, you know what, Eric, I really love you. Your dad's a prick. You know, I'm like, hey, easy. You know, it's my dad. It's my dad, you know. But but literally, you know, um, he always treated me great. And, you know, he brought me into ECW, you know, just because of that. So, so Paul treated me great, but that's what I heard happen. That is more or less exactly what I was reading, apart from the fact that it was also hotel receipts where he pretended to stay at hotels where he didn't. And also, he, I think he was... I don't know if many people were doing this, but back in the day, this is sort of before I was flying frequently pre-9-11, is that an airline ticket was as good as cash. So I don't know how many of oh. you guys were sort of storing them and then trading them in at a later date. Right. So so back in the day, especially with Delta being in Atlanta, right, on your tickets to this day, there will be different classes. And, and, if you, and we're not talking about class of seating, class of tickets. And WCW was famous for not looking ahead, and and they were famous for booking your tickets last second. So when they did, they paid the most money, and those are called Class A tickets. Well, we all knew in Delta, there's these guys called Red Coat Securities. Well, they were bought with WCW credit cards, right? Mm -hmm. But this was something that we all really did. And so what you would do is, if you already knew you're flying out, there are a lot of times what I would do is I would call and I would say, Hey, I want to use some miles. And I only did it on some kind of like crazy ticket, like last second to New York or something that's $1,200 or something. And what you do is you'd go ahead and book your flight. You would use your miles, but here's the deal. You did not turn that ticket down because then it would go back on the credit card. You kept the ticket as cash you would go and book another flight wherever you wanted to. They would use that credit onto the new flight. Then you would then take that flight and turn it back in for cash because it had gotten off the credit card, right? Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of games, man. You know, the, um, for most of your guys, uh, except for like Sting and, and maybe Vader and, and maybe Lex Luger, uh, you know, in your agreements were that you had to, uh, you know, you had to ride in a car with at least uh, two other people to get the car paid for. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so a lot of, you know, so a lot of us. So there was there was especially in tax scenarios, there was a lot of jockeying with receipts. OK, so like, like, like I will just say. IRS, if you're listening, I didn't necessarily do this government tax people in, in America. It's, but, it's a seven year, so, it's a seven year uh, cutoff point, isn't it? So it doesn't even matter to the nineties, yeah. man. Yeah. So 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 sometimes I would go and say, like, if you or me were on the road, and let's just say you weren't that famous, you were just up and coming. Okay. Well, then I'd say, hey, James, we're gonna split a room. Hey, okay, man. Yeah, where are you at? The Marriott. Oh, I, you know, I usually stay in shitty hotels. Now, you're staying at the Marriott. Let's split rooms. Or, and what would end up happening is I would go to the front desk and I'd say, hey, listen, my, my real name is James, and, but, but my stage name is Eric Watts. So, so I need to put the room under James. So when I checked out, I, they would print me the, the ticket for James. I go, hey, hey for, for my taxes, I got to give my account. My account does everything under my stage name. Could you can you change James's name to Eric Watts? And they go, oh yeah, and they print me another receipt. Well, that way you left with a receipt for the total hotel, and I left with the receipt for the total hotel. <laughs> you know, and and so when we when we ran and did the gas back back in the day, right? If you went and did gas, a lot of times I would take cash and I wouldn't use my credit cards because if I came and said, hey, here here's a hundred dollars for gas. Hey, can you go ahead and print me two receipts? They would print you two receipts. There's no names on it, right? Okay, I can do that. I can do that. Well, then I would go back to the car where there's three guys and say, hey, it's $33 a piece. Oh, and here I got three receipts for $100 for gas. So, so you know, like, like I mean, you do, it with, you do it with meals all the time. Like with meals, like if we, if we sat down and we, we pile on to one tap and say, hey, we need 
to copy the receipts. The only way you'd get banged up there is if you were dumb enough to use your credit card that shows a different credit card on there. So a lot of times we'd use cash instead. And so it would make your taxes, uh, it looks like your expenses are higher. From what I heard, other people doing. <laughs> For goodness, <laughs> yeah, no, innocent Eric has never done that, let me tell you. I'll tell you what, I'm, innocent. I, 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 I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a, uh, a bit of a game now. I'm going to throw out, it's called Name Association. I'm going to give you a sentence, a description of somebody, and you just tell me the first person who springs to mind who matches that. And the first one is funniest person in the locker room. That, dude, I knew you were going to ask that. I know. I a know. lot of people, a, a lot of people used to say it was me, um, you know, uh, telling jokes or doing imitations. Brad Armstrong was the man of impressions. Like, you know, I, he was always doing some kind of Star Trek too. I've given out his gut, Captain. I can give him no more. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and but 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 what he would do is he would do like three or four characters. He would hit Spock, and he would. So Brad was hilarious, and I will say this. I love Brad with all my heart. I was at his funeral. You know, I have much respect for him. But he was also, everyone was so freaked out. Like, why can this guy tell so many stories and be so funny in the locker room? And then he chokes up on interviews. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 so that was the whole thing. Like, if you would just be a joker and be that on the mic, you'd be Hulk Hogan, right? So I would have to say probably Brad uh, Armstrong. I'm just going to change that question to, Tell me about Brad Armstrong because everybody, everybody says Brad Armstrong for that question. Uh, next one, most okay. miserable person in the locker room. Always a e or the donkey frown sort of thing. Oof! Wow. I the, the I need a I, I need like a, a top ten list because there is a, <laughs> some brutal stuff. You know, v Vader was never happy. Uh, Rude Rude was never happy. Scott Steiner. I I don't even know that man knows how to smile. No, he did the other day when I was at his son's basketball game. He smiled like a son of a bitch. But I was like, I was like telling Dallas, I'm like, Dallas, look, his kid's awesome. Scott smiles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, Dallas was like, Dallas was looking at him too because that guy does not smile, right? Uh, so yeah, there there was some tense, tense. There were some tense people in those locker rooms. Last man standing at the bar. Man, I gotta be. I gotta be honest with you. I would normally say me, just because of what I, I I felt about myself. But going as a kid, looking back, I don't care what happened at WWE. Steve Doctor Death Williams in his prime. Steve Doctor Death Williams in in his prime. You know, not not before the. You know, he was so burnt out when he fought. You know, in the tough man thing when JBL. You know, knocked him out. That was he was he was too punch drunk by that time. Um, Hacksaw Jim Dugan was disgustingly I, I, tough. I, uh, you're the only second person who uh, has taken it the wrong way that I meant it to. I meant uh, drinking. Oh, oh drinking. <laughs> it's only you uh, and Ken Shamrock. You and Ken Shamrock are the only two who have thought of it like in oh, fighting. Sorry, because sorry. Sorry, I was ready to fight you over that bullshit. <laughs> um, I will say the man that was most known for drinking the most and buying the whole bar's drinks was Ric Flair. Yeah. Um, uh, barbarian. Uh, but Barbarian was a beast, um, drink wise. There's Barbie when, when I first broke in, right? I was staying at this this crappy hotel in Atlanta by the airport. But this is like no matter where the guy stayed, no matter where Flair stayed or whatever, there was a manager at this Holiday Inn and she would get all the guys free drinks. And so all the guys would come to that hotel to drink and then it would be packed with fans, packed with fans because she loved it because she was making so much money off the fans. But then they would all go stay at other hotels because they didn't like that hotel that much. Right. <laughs> so so when I was training, that's the hotel that I stayed at when I was training that three weeks. Well, uh, the, the, the girl comes up to me. She goes, hey, listen, Eric, you know, tonight some of the guys are going to come in. She goes, but be careful of, of Barbarian. I go, why? He goes, well, he, he likes young, good-looking kids. I go, what? He goes, she goes you're good-looking and, and you're young. And I go, what do you, what, what do you mean? He likes because just, just stay away from him at closing time. I go, no, so now I'm freaked out. D Delane was her name. So we're drinking and we're drinking and people are leaving and, and it's kind of getting to where I, me and him and we're kind of the last few people at the bar and I'll be a son of a gun if he goes, hey, brother, uh, you, you young, strong boy. Yeah, uh, football. Yeah, college football. Yeah, 
yeah, a real tough man. Huh? I heard you're tough man, you know? And I said, yeah, yeah, I guess. And he was known as being a killer, right? Like, like he, there, there were stories of him beating up like 15 police officers at that place. I mean, like this guy, he goes, he goes, brother, uh, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I get back, maybe you and me, I take you to my room. And I go, what the fudge? So Delaney looks, she goes, I told you. So he goes to the bathroom. I went and I said, give me keys to another hotel. I got a different hotel room. I said, she goes, I'll protect you. I'll protect you. She goes, I won't let him know what room you're in. That whole night, because because that, it was one of those hotels where the rooms are either outside towards the parking lot or they their door just open up to the pool. And I'm like, this big bastard is going to find out where I'm at. Right. And, and so I did not sleep well that night. I had stuff against my door. I didn't say, and so um, it wasn't until like, you know, six months, a year later that that was Delaney and his rib that they, he would play on new rookie talent. I was freaking out. Like, oh, hell <laughs> no, no. <laughs> he is the nicest man as well. Barbara. I interviewed him a few months ago. What a sweetheart he is. And, and uh, listen, Ming, Ming, if you ever get a chance to get Ming, one of the most beautiful people. And, and let me tell you, so because my dad, you know, he started way back by bringing Alpha and Sika. And, you know, my dad was the one that he, he would do stuff with the people in Hawaii. And he, my dad traded a lot of talent. So he brought in some Samoans and all this other stuff. Right. So so um, my, my dad would say, he goes, hey, let me explain something to you. The, the, you know, Samoans. <laughs> It's a different, like, it's a different thing. He goes, you know, like, they'll swim over to other islands just to kill other people, you know? <laughs> goes, yeah, so, so, uh, so, but what's so funny is everyone knew what a badass barbarian was, but everyone also knew what a badass Ming was. And what was so hilarious, if you're with Ming, he go, brother, the only guy I wouldn't mess with is barbarian. And if you're talking to barbarian, go, brother, uh, I might be tough. Uh, I can't handle Ming. You know, and they'd say about each other. And Ming would do this damn thing, bro. I've never seen it because he's like a 900th degree black belt or some shit. He would, to warm up, he would stand in a doorway. He would swing his foot backwards and up and hit his toe on the top of the, uh, the, 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 the steel throughway with both legs. He'd go one, then he'd do the other one. I'm like, you mean to tell me this dude is like 300 pounds of muscle He's flexible. He's got 99 degrees in black belt shit. And he and he can he can kick like he can kick a pencil off the top of a, a wall too. Like if I do get in a fight, God, please not with these guys. You know, so so I was I was a I was always hanging around those guys like, hey, we're best friends, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, so like one on one arm, one on the other. Let's go trip. Let's party, dudes. Do you, do you see my two brothers over here? They're a little more they're they're a little bit more tan than me, but <laughs> Dude, what is it? What is it? Because I hear so many stories about, you know, Haku was the toughest and stuff like that, but I always hear the same amount of stories where they're always saying that people couldn't always started fights with Haku Meng. It's like, why would you look at that dude and think, this is the guy I want to tangle with? But see, my dad was known. Like, I mean, my dad was known. I can't tell you how many lawsuits he'd have. You know, sometimes my dad coming out of a ring. Back then, there'd be so much heat that, 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 that people would come into the ring with like knives and stuff. And there was times when my dad would literally fight his, for his life out of the ring. And sometimes you'd have to go out a front door. The, the cops would even get overrun. And these people would have like knives and pens and trying to stab him. And and I think I think one time the promoter had to get rid of him because he had fourteen lawsuits in one night from knocking people out. And, and so, so the guy that was interviewing him, I heard a podcast about six months ago interviewing my dad. And the guy said, well, so Mr. Watts, we heard that you had a lawsuit one time, like seven people. He goes, no, it was 14. He goes, <laughs> he, he goes, he goes, and my favorite is when you knock someone out and you hit them so hard, that their face kind of like melts around your face, around your fist. But the beauty is when they hit someone, it's called a ricochet shot when you knock out two or more people with the same guy's head. And he goes, so he goes, I, because he was the world's strongest man at one time. So he's like, I would hit people so hard that they literally would fly into other people and knock other people out. He said, so I didn't probably hit 14 people, but there's some pretty good bank shots. And he goes, <laughs> and I can't, <laughs> and, and on the podcast, now my dad's 84. Okay. 84. He goes, he goes, and I can't say that there weren't any women or children included. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and you're like he, he goes, he goes, but let me tell you what, 
a woman or a child with a knife in their hand coming at me, it's all fair game. Yeah. I'm like, you know, you know, because I mean, my dad will also tell stories like as a bad guy, like in Minnesota one time, he had this lady. I can't remember how old she was, maybe 60, 65 years old. And she came and uh, stabbed a big pin into his calf. It, 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 as he ring. Well, he, he felt someone get him and he's in the ring and he was so pissed off the security, you know, didn't do. So he feels it and he just turns around and backhands it. And he said about halfway through, he saw it was an old silver haired lady. Oh. Breaks her jaw, gives her brain damage, brain damage. So they, they, they sue him. So now now that federation is going to have to fire my dad because of the lawsuit. And so my dad's like, you won't believe this shit. He goes, you know, the lawsuit didn't happen for about six, seven months. I shaved my face. I cut my hair really short. I went in all, and she goes, there's a lady like slurring, you know, her mouth's dripping. And they go, you know, talk. And so she's trying to tell the story and her lawyers are trying to tell the story. And he goes, well, ma'am, do you see this man in court? She goes, no. And because she didn't, <laughs> Yeah, so, so my dad, my, my dad goes, "Hey, I hate that you had brain damage and shit." He goes, "But it got me off that one too." I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> "It's it's rough, bro." Do, do you know, like, I really figured your dad. I mean, he's like what six four, six three, six four, or whatever, and he was a master of disguise. Yeah. I hadn't quite. <laughs> that doesn't. Yeah, quite... yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's like in his prime. He was six five, three hundred twenty pounds, and, and I, I got pictures of him. He'd go to Hawaii. And uh, once a year to do, you know, like bench a lot of weight. I and mean, he benched a lot. Him and Bruno, Mar- uh, uh, um, uh, Bruno San Martino were two of the strongest men. And my dad's workout really never changed. He would do, he would do um, 225. Back in the day, the collars that you'd put on a bench were two and a half pounds each. So they'd be five pounds. You didn't count those. So two plates are 225, three, 305, you know, and it kept on going to 90 pounds, 90 pounds. So my dad would do – he'd do 20 reps with 225, and then he would do 10 reps per 90 pounds up to five uh, – up to 495, all the way up 10, 10, 20, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Then he'd do doubles, uh, and he'd add 10 pounds. So he'd go 495, 505, 515, 525, 535. He'd go all the way up to 565, back down, then do 10s, 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 and do 20. That was his bench workout every effing week. Like he was, he was, he was a gorilla. No, he was, he was insane. He was insane. The like guy I remember as a kid, he built the gym in our house, and he had me and my little brother grab him by the waist, while he, or or his leg, while he did pull ups. He was a beast. <laughs> he was a beast. He was a beast. He was a beast. I'm going to give you a few more uh, out of this. I've got yes. like about thirty. I'll try and pick the best ones for you. Uh, I always ask this one, and it's always the same name: smelliest wrestler. Oh uh, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you may say the same name, but uh, there was actually these twins from Texas. I can't remember their names, uh, and they're they, they, they were they were horrible. They're so bad that we did a rib on them. We did a bunkhouse. I mean, we did a we did a uh, a battle royal at the end of a show, and Sting and I all got in it, and we actually brought tape, and we got the guys in the corners, taped them, and we brought in water bottles and soap, and gashed them with soap <laughs> and shit. And Sting jumped out of the ring and left those both in there. It was the worst thing we've ever done. It exposed the business. Um, I cannot rem- it, remember the were tag. They, were they the Colossal Kongs? Yes. Yes. I've only yes. just heard of them today because I was looking for something about the Shopmaster. And, and yes. How crazy is that as a coincidence? They smell like ass. And and, <laughs> and, 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 here, and, and here's what pisses here's what would piss you off, too. They were disgusting. And they were so big and so fat. And so when you were coming down a road, you would know what car they're in because one would sit up and drive. The other one would be in the back seat of a Cadillac with the seat all the way up because they were so fat. They could not sit in the same car. They had to sit. And they, they would never wash their wrestling gear. So by your seventh eighth day, you can imagine. And, and a lot of times you would see them in the car in their gear. Like oh no so so I don't know who uh, who's some other names people have thrown out on that one. Uh, there's generally only two or three: Vader, Balls Mahoney, and whoever. Balls. Is it like is it like icy hot or something like that? They used to rub in the muscles. No, what, yeah, what's yeah, that glistening yeah. stuff? Apparently, everyone used to stink um, from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? 
a lot of people and I, I made fun of them. And then the last two years I couldn't, I could, uh, I, I became allergic to it too. Uh, Brian Armstrong was really allergic to it. Um, but it was a thing, it was a vasculator and you'd spray it and it would turn, you were like red, but if you tanned a lot, it would make you look even more tan, but it also bring your veins to the surface. Right. So you look more, you, you look more pumped up and it, yeah, it was called, God, you said it exactly. Literally, I had no problem with it. In one year, all of a sudden, I went to spray it, and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. So you, so you could become allergic to that stuff. But you're right. Everyone wore that shit. Everyone wore it. Oh, who am I going to say next? Who am I going to say next? Or what am I going to say next? Uh, this, is, this is a struggle. I'm trying to get the best ones out. Let's say uh, the um, stiffest or most reckless. Later. Okay, an easy one. Hands um, down. Uh, do, 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 do. town. No, I'm not going to ask that one. I'm sorry. I've got so many. I'm trying to pick the best ones here. Uh, yeah. Most talented. Let's go for the most talented wrestler you ever worked with. Wow. Steamboat. Steamboat. We're really drinking Steamboat, probably. Yeah. Probably an easy man, one. But, man, but, 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 bro, think about it. My career was so blessed that I got to wrestle with so many people that I idolized as a child. So then you add, you add that to it, right? Like doing, uh, doing one of the greatest angles was an angle that Arn Anderson came up in which I ended up because he did need knee surgery. He, he, he found me in Charlotte and, and we got into a fight in the, in the uh, gas station. Yeah. Right. And the thing, and literally, it was great because he, he shoot had to have surgery. And if, if you go back to where that little girl was there and the dad, and they were signing an autograph, and then he comes up and says, Watts, I told you not to be in Charlotte, all this other stuff. I always would put the STF on the left leg. He was so good with detail in his interviews and everything else. He said, hey, my knee operation is actually going to be on my right leg, so make sure you STF my right leg. That's how professional. And, and so – you take him, and here I am. It's even my first year, and I'm doing a flipping tour, and the heat on me was so huge. And and people would come up to Arn, and Arn would tell me, why are you doing this? You've got to hate it. And he would act like, oh, I'm so sick. The office is making me do this. He's the one that came up with it. He's the one that came up with the angle, and it helped me so much and made me so much. He goes, Eric, these guys don't get it. He goes – if you've got heat here, you got heat in the audience. He said, so I'm just going to take the, I'm going to take who's talked about the most in the kayfabe sheets and all that, da, 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 and I'm going to do an angle with him. Why wouldn't I? Now he said, he goes, but don't tell anyone this. So I don't even know how many people know that to this day. That was an Arn Anderson. He cooked that whole thing up. Uh, there's two things actually, because I was going to ask this uh, somewhere else. And one, I can't help but notice that Arn is wearing Zubaz. During that thing, it's, it's like bright pink Zubaz. <laughs> Unbelievable! And you know, and, and you know, the old school guys like Brad Armstrong and him. I'll be a son of a bitch if they didn't have the Zubaz all the time. And a lot of times, uh, you know, because the big deal was to go get the uh, the jacket from the steak place in Tokyo, uh, Ribera, uh, Ribera Steakhouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And brother, you know, people would fight over those, right? <laughs> you know, they would fight. And I went to Ribera's, and I went to, you know, because I wrestled Japan and all this other stuff. I never got one of the jackets. But but those Zubas, bro, the Zubas, the fanny packs, and the high-tech boots are called high-tech that you go work out with, the, the military black boots. That's all we wore, man. That's all we wore. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, is Arn has said this, the police who turned up rolled around, you know, when you've got Arn in the STF. Yeah. Were they in on it or not? Because Arn has suggested that they just happened to be passing. I bet you Arn doesn't even know this. So <laughs> this is hilarious. So Dusty Rhodes is the producer of this shot. So they came up with this idea that, and uh, okay, I can't remember. I was supposed to get married on like February, whatever it was, 13th or whatever Valentine's Day was. I had asked a year in advance, or sixth or some shit. I asked a year in advance. My my fiance has got the the napkins, the, 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 the everything monogrammed, the marriage, marriage, marriage. <clears throat> and my career takes off so fast that my dad goes, Hey, listen, I know that you said that, you know, 
you're going to get married, but shit changes. We got a pay-per-view. I said, but dad, and he goes, no, this angle between you and Arn is so hot that you're going to have to show up in this pay-per-view. I said, but that's the day of my wedding. He goes, right. So you're going to have to change your wedding. Literally, we had we had to move the wedding back to the like the week before, the week after. All our shit is for a different week. <laughs> it's hilarious. So anyway, so so Dream comes up with this thing about you know basically Arn. Arn was I was going to get suspended for getting in a fight with Arn because it's in it's in Charlotte, right? And so the irony of this, which is so beautiful, Arn attacks me. I end up getting the better of Arn. But I get arrested because the police are Arn, love Arn Anderson so much. So now I am suspended from the pay-per-view. It's only because of this girl whose dad was taking a picture of her getting her autograph by her favorite wrestler that exposed the truth about this corrupt police and Arn Anderson, right? And so then they did it, and then all of a sudden I was put back on the show. And if you would have heard the place erupt and the shit that happened live, and, I, and let me tell you something else. I cannot tell you how many people 100% knew that wrestling was fake, but they knew 100% that that fight actually happened. I can't tell you how many people. So, so Dusty Rhodes says, hey, babe, hey, babe, uh, let, 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 me, let me at the Pizza Hut, if you will, across the street, and then we're going to go over this. And so I'm sitting with Dusty, right? And it's about noon, and pizza's got a buffet. Well, it starts kind of sleeting. It is cold as hell. And it's sleeting. He goes, Get it. I think I'm going to produce <laughs> from here in Pizza Hut. So he never, he never came across to kind of watch it and get the videotapes. Literally, this was me pulling up into a gas station, a girl's dad. So now she comes up, and I'm like, yeah, 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 how are you doing? And here comes Arn barreling. It was hilarious because the car kind of jumped up. He came in so fast. Like, he came in. And he comes in Watts and boom, and hits me and bam, 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 and it's going. Well, what ends up happening is then I turn the tide on him. I get him in the SDF, and I'm cranking him. Well, no one smartened up the owner of the gas station. Oh, really? So now he's coming out. Now, here's the deal. I was just told some police are going to come up. They're going to arrest me, and they're going to take me off. That's what Arden knew, too. So here comes a guy, and if you look at me, if you watch it, you'll see me saying something. To a, to, to, to a guy coming out. And what, because he, now think of this. I got him in an STF. This guy said, I'm calling the police. I'm calling the police. And he's like grabbing like his guy's phone. But I don't know if the guy's got a gun. Like, I don't know. Like, is this guy going to shoot me or is he going to? So I said, I said, mother. Oh, well, you know, I can say, I said, I, I said, let me explain something. To you. you get any closer, I'll break your effing neck. So now I am threatening, verbally threatening that guy because I am halfway scared I'm going to get shot by someone. I don't know who it is, why they're screaming at me, what's going on. So now police come up. I have my Fiesta Bowl ring on. Fiesta Bowl is a, a huge college bowl. It used to be one of the top three. Um, in my, in my, my junior year, we played the University of Alabama, which is known in America as like the, the, the pinnacle of teams. And we crushed them 34 to seven. So, so to say anything, that bowl ring meant a lot to me. So I got my bowl ring on, I got my, you know, Rolex on, I'm doing my thing. Right. Here comes these cops. These guys, what are you doing, bro? When they grab me, they grab me and they get, what are you doing? Cuff me. Now, listen, those cuffs depend on your wrist. When they clamp them, it's steel, bro. And if they want to, if they want to light your world up, they they lit my world up. Then they take me and slam me into the car, split my ear in half, split my ear in half. My bowl ring goes off my hands, so it's in the parking lot. I'm bleeding. They jam me. Now I'm six six. Those cars are not very big in the back seat where they keep the dogs and stuff. I'm in there, but they, when they threw me, I'm sitting on my fingers are weird. And I feel like I'm like breaking my fingers. So now, but, but, but I'm, but my knees are caught in the seats. So I'm trying to move and I'm like, and, and I mean, I'm like dizzy and they get in and they go, they're just dog cussing me. Get me in the car. Yeah. We're going to put you under the jail. I'm like, so I go, so I go, Hey guys, guys, can we loosen these effing cuffs up? (laughs) What? you know, we should beat your ass. I'm like, guys, 
you are the best actors I've ever been around because if, if it, I, I said this is it. If anyone else wonders how good you are, please have me as a referral for you. You guys are taking this all the time. I said, guys, we're five minutes away from that fucking place. They go, what are you talking about? All of a sudden, dispatch. Um, car 51, car 51. And they go, yes. They go, do you have Eric Watts in the car? And they go, yes. Uh, uh, whatever, the colonel or the, you know, the highest ranking sheriff or whatever gets on. Yes, we've got to talk. Can you pull over, please? And they go, we need to get Eric Watts back to that site and release him. Like, release him. There was an all out brawl in the middle. Beep, 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 beep. This guy, this assault and battery. But they go, no, that was a staged thing. And the cops that were supposed to be there did not okay it with me. And they got held up in a, a call. And you guys got the real call because there was not going to be a call. The gas station guy called. Right. We sent it out. This kid, and so 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 then when they took me back, that girl had actually found my ring, gave me my ring, my ears bleeding. And no, it was shoot. It was real. And, and it was real police that were coming, but Dusty had worked it out with some rest of police officers that were fans that were supposed to tell the chief of police, but didn't tell the chief of police for whatever reason. And you know what, you know, whatever reason. So, but but you look back at it and it made that whole video because it was stressful like it was it was it was like we say it's a shoot and and so it was it was it was a shoot yeah yeah i mean i was i was like guys man you guys are awesome i mean <laughs> my ears me- i mean my ears messed up you know and they're like shut up you know we, we should beat your head and i'm like okay this is really good acting you guys are awesome is there academy war for your asses cuz i'm like I think I'm being funny and they're getting more mad at me. Like, <laughs> you think that's funny? <laughs> yeah. So, so Ar- Arn is a hundred percent right. But see, Arn, Arn didn't know all that. I don't know what Arn knows not because, you know, he got back in his car and left or did whatever he did. Right. You know, I, I, I don't know what happened. Right. You know, so me and him, you know, the funny thing about it is I, I saw him probably about three years ago. We've, I, I've, all I ever do when I see Arn is hug him and tell him I love him and say, sir, at a time when you should have never, ever wanted to ever even be in the same locker room with me because I had so much heat. You of all people, you, you, you are so confident in who you are as a wrestler and a person that you took on a project that no one else would ever want, sir. And you changed my trajectory because once they saw Arn and I do this angle and then we sold out everywhere because everyone wanted to pay to see Arn Anderson whip my ass. But, but, but now listen, 21 days of training. I'm five or six months into this thing or seven months, whatever, when I do this Arn Anderson thing. And then we go on the road when he gets his knee done. We go on the road for three, four, five. I don't know how long they stretched out. How else could you or who else could you ever ask to go on the road for a month, month and a half and do an angle with him? other than Arn flipping Anderson, right? I mean, there's there's baby faces that I wish I could have gone on, like a like a Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, but but he's a baby face, right? That you know, I would love to go on the road with Sting, you know, uh, uh to, to 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 be in the ring with him as he calls a match or as he performs and does his stuff. But man, the pinnacle, you know, you're talking about Arn freaking, I mean, you know, like on the you know, around Mount Rushmore, he he could very easily be like on a Mount Rushmore of pro wrestlers. You know, he really could. I mean, or he, he's up there. The man's amazing. The man's amazing. Right, so so I'm going to give you two more questions, and then I will thank you so much for your time. Go Cardinals. And, uh, yeah. yeah, go Cardinals. <laughs> I do, I, I tell you what, like, Dutch always, Dutch always talks to me about Clemson. And I know nothing about American football. All I know is that he's very disappointed in Clemson year after year. Yeah, well, because Clemson came out of nowhere and crushed everybody. Right. They, they, you know, they had Deshaun Watson and they, and they sit there and they crush everything and they just, they, they, they haven't repeated, but listen, that, Cle- that Clemson's coach is good. So let me just say this the nicest way. He's only upset because that shit ass team won a few times and they thought they were going to be great forever. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so be happy that they actually had a good streak for a while. You know, D- Dutch is uh Dutch is one of a kind. Yeah, uh, I've got. I'm, I'm, I'm going to send that Dutch as well. Let me tell you. Right, I'm going to give you two more questions, and 
They are the most memorable backstage fights. Uh, as a child, uh, was um, it was uh, Butch Reed and uh, John Nord, which was the Barbarian. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable backstage fights, and that's it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any others. I mean, I got into it with Rick Rude, but but uh, other than that, I know, other than that, I got to be honest with you. Even as a kid, I saw wrestlers pummel some fans that threw like lit cigarettes, or you know, a lot of times back in the old days, people would urinate in cups and throw urine on you when you're coming back or stuff like that. The worst one was a lot of times bad guys they would take their cigarettes and flick them at you. And at your back, because when you're sweaty, sometimes the cigarette would, and then the cherry would burn your back. And it would be, so I've seen people like rip a fan out and beat the brains out or something like that. But in my dad's territory, you didn't see, you know, you didn't see any fights. And when I was coming up at WCW, WWE, ECW, all the places I've been in, I've never seen uh, anyone get in a fight in the back. Yeah, okay. If this next question also is a bit of a bust on the answer, then you might have to permit me one more. But, um, the, okay. the wrestler least winning, uh, willing to lose. Who? Uh, man, I, I, you know, here, here's the problem with that answer. I don't know the stroke that certain people had or not have, right? Like Hogan, Hogan had in his agreement, from what I understand, he had creative control. So he decided who won, who lost. A matter of fact, when he laid down to Goldberg in Atlanta, in the Omni sold out staying room only, on pay-per-view, he had asked me, pulled me aside, and I went and smartened up Goldberg before Goldberg went out. He didn't he Goldberg was Goldberg was told he's laying down, that he was going to lose his hundredth match. Hogan switched it and said, I'm so proud of this kid. I want him to beat me. And then the next day, that was the hundredth. Then the next day on Monday night, Nitro, he beat Goldberg for Goldberg's first loss, right? So I see, you know, so when you when you talk about it, you know, I, I don't know about Undertaker, right? But I'm gonna tell you, let's just put it this way. There were guys in wrestling that did not want to ever lose because it was a machismo thing like i don't think scott steiner ever wanted to lose uh you know rick flair lost many of times right and dusty Rhodes won lost many of times but but it was few and far between right so those guys you know like rick flair he went along with the world uh, how many world championships and titles did he have you know and all this other stuff so um if you're talking about the, the way I would change that answer is who who in wrestling didn't know that wrestling was fake. <laughs> because they, 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 Vader, well, people won't, I said Vader was the most reckless. And let me tell you why Vader was reckless. He, I was in, I was in Augusta, Georgia or Macon, Georgia. I can't remember when. And he broke a kid's neck. And it was the match before me, mine. And he, Joke slammed the guy, then he picked the guy up after he broke the and then power bombed the kid, broke his neck. They they came and they took down the ring ropes, put him on a gurney, and came back and said, You got 30 seconds to rewarm up. I, I we said I sat there for like 20 minutes watching this kid like you know paralyzed or whatever. And I was like, because I thought they were gonna cancel the show. Oh no, they they just stretched the kid out and then went on to wrestle. But so Vader one time. Uh, and I'm going to put it in perspective for you. So Vader, one time, there was a match, and I can't remember where we're at. And I think it was going to be – I think it was a TV match. And Vader was going to come in at the very end. and Or, or no, wait. Vader was going to be in the ring, and I think he was going to hang Sting. Maybe he was hanging Sting or something like that with the thing. And then all the baby faces were to come in, and as the baby faces, he was going to you know, knock people down, knock people down. And Vader got along with me so well that he said, hey, bro, I'm going to tell you this. When you come in, just just come in, duck my clothesline, and but but just keep on going going out because if you stay in the ring, I'm going to take your fucking head off. I said okay. He goes he goes 
man, people don't know this about me. He goes, I get so intense and so worked up. I think that the match is real. And I'm like, yeah, Vader, nine times out of 10, would throw up before he go out wrestling. Really? He would get so nervous and so intense. And, and, and you know, when he come up, go, hoo, 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 you know, do all that crap. Oh, he would do that. Just get rid. He would do the. He would do the Hindu squats. He always had the band. He would always do the. He'd do the thing. But bro, he was getting ready for a flipping UFC fight before every match, and so literally, yes, he could be careless, but and, and there's no excuse for it. He was so intense that it, it, it was just this. Goldberg hurt, hurt himself a lot of times. Andy, and, and for a while, people were scared to take the spear because he would literally split his head open spearing people like he did. Like, like when they did the when they did the sparkles out, you know, shooting the sparkles, he on purpose wanted the fog machine so he could blow out. And he said, I want those sparkles to run on me and burn me before I go out there so I can be jacked up. Right. So there are some people that they're you know, they were just in a they were now Benoit. He would warm up that way. But Benoit was just, again, one of the greatest wrestlers of all times. You know, he, but, you know, there's a few times I'll watch him warm up. I'm like, he is going to kill someone. And then when I had to wrestle him, I'm going, well, maybe he's going to try to kill me. You know, because, I mean, like, he would kick the wall as hard as he could kick the wall. I'm like, what are you doing? He goes, you got to make it look real. I'm like, no, that wall is not going to move. And I think you broke the fucking butt. <laughs> you, know, uh, and, and, you know, and he was kicking butt um, and slaps and stuff like that. So um, there are some guys out there. Um, that and, you know Goldberg, he's a very competitive dude. He didn't want to pro wrestle, right? Me, 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 and Bill are from the same hometown, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I actually saw Bill in a gym up here. I didn't know he was here. And I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "Well, I'm playing football." I said, "What, what team are you on?" He goes, "Eric, I've gone to about six teams. I get cut right before I make the roster on these teams." I said, "Why do you think about pro wrestling?" He goes, "Eric, I love you, and I love your dad. He's a legend." He goes, "There's no way I'm going to do that fake bullshit." And I go, "Excuse me." He goes, "Oh no, no, no. What I'm saying is." With all due respect, Eric, I go, what? He goes, oh, I think I want to train for the UFC. I said, Bill, you're never going to be in the UFC or nothing like this. you got to be doing that since you're a kid and all this other stuff. You know? So it was me that introduced. I told DDP about Bill Goldberg. DDP told Bish, Bischoff. Bischoff and them came to main event fitness to meet him because he's working out. And, 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 that, and that's how they got but he was he's a very intense, very competitive guy. He did not want to lose. Did he still have the hair at that time? Who sort of gave him the horrible, idea to like the horrible hair? Horror yeah, it was a horrible haircut. Horrible. It looked just like um it looked just like uh Stone Colds. Remember Stone Colds when he was Hollywood Bond? You know, what I mean, because when he was a Hollywood Bond, he kind of looked like Hogan's, you know, the the totally, totally gone up here long in the back, you know. Oh, Goldberg was hideous. <laughs> hi- hi- hideous. Uh, ju- just going back to what you said about Vader, I believe was it Joe Thurman, the kid's name, who uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I also heard that um, like some guys had come in, some young guys had come in who were you know just brought in to do enhancement work, and they would see their name against Vader on the blackboard, and they would quit the business. Gone. See you later. Yeah. No. It, uh, it, I mean, and 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 again, that is very sad because. As my father, you know, you know, some of the things that my dad instilled in me, like he's like, Eric, you know, you'll see these guys sometimes go up for a body slam and they won't they won't post up on the guy's quad. So, you know, when you go up, post on the quad. Well, the whole reason to post on the quad is not to help get you up. The post on the quad is so if the guy if you're sweaty and you slip, you have something to push off of so you don't break your neck. That's that. That's the reason. Mm. And you know, my mom, you know, used to instill this. And my dad used to instill. He goes, "Why well, my, my I don't know if you've heard this, but my dad used to sometimes not tell the wrestlers what the finish is. He would tell the referee, and then he'd go, go have about you know have about a twenty minute match, and around the twenty minute mark, the ref will tell you who's going over. The reason why is my dad was always trying to teach someone something." And the whole issue is now if you don't know who's going to win, you're going to make your opponent look as good as you can. He's going to make you look as good as you can because you don't know the outcome. You just know you're going to make each other look good. And then whoever wins, wins. That was the problem. That's what my dad said. 
when we started doing all these job matches to where all these guys knew who was winning, they just treated everyone. So my dad would always tell me, he goes, I don't care who you're going to wrestle. You need to make them look good in some way or another, because if you beat a piece of shit, you are just tougher than a piece of shit. You know, that's why I, Ricky, the dragon steamboat, uh, uh, razor Ramon, Sean Michaels, you know, you would watch those guys matches. And one of the funnest things about watching those guys' matches is they would take an enhancement dude and you would forget he was an enhancement dude. And then all of a sudden they're having a barn burning match and they eke a win out. The only reason that that, the only reason that that enhancement guy didn't keep on getting pushed is because no one else could do it. They would just go out there and just beat the enhancement guy. But if more people treated Bob Cook that has one of the greatest punches of all times, right? You know, so at WCW, we started really making uh, Bob Cook's punch or we sold Bob Cook's punches because it looked so good. But you didn't see that all the time, right? You didn't see that all the time. So that was kind of my dad's idea was, you know, these guys get carried away. So if you think about this, if you are truly wrestling, I, when you have me in a brain buster, literally there's nothing I can do. I have to trust you that when you fall back, you are going to lay me with you and not spike my head. When you clothesline me, I am giving you my whole chest and throat. You've got to clothesline me properly or you're going to hurt me. You know, because I've seen guys not look and like elbow you in the nose or break your nose or whatever. So my dad was like, this is what's so amazing to me is I, in my matches, I never really had to worry about myself because I was, it was entrusted that that person was going to take care of me and not hurt me. And I was entrusted to take care of that person or not. I didn't worry about my own health. I worried about the person's eyes wrestling's health. So now you go out there and you have a match where if the other person is only worried about you and making you look good so that they look better if they get to win and they're worried about your health, no one's getting hurt and the match looks awesome. It started the generations where, you know, they were feeding so many guys in there a time and time again that people would get hurt. And, th and that's why it's so disrespectful by the old timers to see people go out there and hurt people and, and us, you know, people would say stuff like that's bullshit. That's what, you know, they, you know, I mean, it's called, it's called a receipt. Someone nails you, you've got a receipt to give them a payback sometime down the road. And there's no, and there, and, 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 and there's no date on that. It could be a day. It could be a year <laughs> when that receipt comes. Right. And, and uh, you've heard, you know, that, Oh my God, that guy's tatered me. He's from Boise, Idaho, the taters, the taters, the taters. Right. I did it. I, I, one time I, um, I, um, I, uh, oh my God, what was it with my spinal cord? It was, uh, I had a spinal cord injury and what happened is here's a Dallas, me and Dallas. And this is how we became such good friends. Uh, every day that I, every day, like the first year I wrestled like 305 matches every day that I was home, even on Sundays, I went to the school, even on my days off, even when my body hurt and Dallas would notice it and go, wow. And I always would bring my video to video my matches because that's how I did in football and that's how I did in high school wrestling and all this other stuff to watch. So he did it. So he was doing it. Right. So we got to know each other. Cause I'm like, who's this old bastard? And he's like, and who's this guy with all the heat? <laughs> and so we became, so we became very, we, we became very good friends. Um, and, and through, and so through, throughout our careers and watching, you know, we learned very early that, our we were in a crazy, crazy time where they were hiring so many guys that truly did not know how to wrestle. You know, good-looking guys, Van Hammer, uh, Mark Camaro, Johnny B. Bad. You know, when he when he came on the scene, he'd never wrestled. I don't even think he watched wrestling. Neither did Hammer, right? Um, so what would happen is we would get in there and we would hurt each other occasionally, me and Dallas, because we were trying to be so snug. So when you go to throw someone out of the ring, OK, so if you're if I say, hey, I'm going to toss you out and I'm not saying toss you out like like I'm down and you go to grab me and I grab your tights and throw you out. The, the rule is to fall perpendicular with the ropes and pull the person out so they don't they don't blow their knee or ankle stepping on you going out of the ring. That's the reason why Dallas goes. I'm going to shit can you and, and sits up like the dead man, like <laughs> taker grabs me and pulls me over at about a million miles an hour. Well, first of all, I'm trying to miss him. He is like 
jerked me out as hard as he could because the adrenaline's going. Well, what happened is as I'm trying to miss him and miss him, the, the ropes hit my hands. Okay. And so now my hands go like this, straight into the steel barricade, head first outside. Boom. So now the ref comes out, Eric, you know, and I'm seeing stars and the concussion. And so I stress my spinal cord. So the next day we have TV. And so we flew in. I didn't see him after the match. He didn't see me after the match. And I'm like, bro, I got a receipt for you. He goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, he goes, bro, you got a receipt for me. I got a receipt for you. I go, bro, you almost bro- broke my neck. I was at the hospital all night. You know, they don't even want me to wrestle. You know, blah, blah, blah. He goes, bro, look, hear me out. He pointed at his ear. Listen to me. Do you see how black this is? His effing ear was completely black. And then there was this god-awful purple and some green. I go, what happened to you? Did you get in a fight afterwards? He goes, no, that was one of your punches last night. I punched him in the ear so hard, it blacked his... And I'm thinking to myself, I am so sorry, right? So he stresses my spinal cord. I hit him in the ear to bl- – and you know how hard – it hurts when you yeah. get sl- slammed in the ear, right? So – but that that was kind of, you know, the Kevin Nashes and the, um, you know, us. And, and, and so there was a lot of guys out there learning at a fast pace on TV or in big shows. And the last thing we wanted people – to do in the audience would start booing or saying boring or whatever so then we overcompensated a lot like running our shoulder into a turnbuckle 10 times harder than we needed to or or punches or a lot of slaps or god forbid we pick up a chair and you know any of, the, any of us picking up a chair we knew we were going to give someone a concussion because we were like <laughs> swing it <laughs> you know the only one that loved it was like mankind he's like yeah. hit me as hard as you can <laughs> and you don't put your hands up back in those days either do you no no no, no. you know there, there was like Pillman and a few of those guys that got so good that they, they were so fast at putting their hand up. You never even saw the hand go up if they did it. But no, you, no, you didn't, you know, and that's why I used to tell people all the time with, with Vince being a multi-billionaire, the two things I never figured out was why did they not go to NASA or 3M or some of these companies that learn how to make things bigger, better, softer, whatever. And why didn't they find rings that we're, we're giving because the WC, the WWE rings when I was there were the hardest effing other than Germany. Germany was the hardest. Germany's hardest, but it was, it was horrible. Those rings were horrible. And I asked Vince, he goes, well, the reason why is I love doing battle Royals and Royal Rumbles. So I make them, I make the rings stiff enough to have 20 guys in it. I'm like, yeah, but, but, but we're not doing that 95% of the time. He goes, yep. But when I need them, I got them. I'm like, that, that's, <laughs> I mean, to, 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 to me, I was like, as the athlete, I'm like, that doesn't, and then the next thing is, why in the F are we using real chairs, right? I mean, I mean, I mean my, my, my point is, why even fake it? Because I, I, I don't, I've hurt myself just picking up a chair before and hit myself in the knee accidentally or whatever. Th- those chairs just do not give. And I'll tell you the ones that are worse are the ones with the big padding on the bottom. Because the ones that have the big pad and you go to hit someone, it's so heavy that when you swing it, it doesn't hurt like metal, but it's like you got hit by a, like a punching bag. Like, like you got slammed. So, so it, it could concuss you harder than the steel chair could, you know, the ones with the big pads. So, um, yeah, very interesting. So, it, again, what we were talking about receipts and with Dallas Page and stuff like that. So there were receipts, but the only time you ever gave a person a receipt or, you know, is if they were just ridiculously out of control, you know, all the time. I will, I will shut the podcast down in one second. I'll just tell you this, is that the reason that uh, the WWF ended up changing the rings in like 98, 99, so I've heard, is because Vince McMahon himself got started getting into the ring. And then he started taking <laughs> bumps and he just took one and went, fuck that. And then that's when he had all the rings redesigned so they were a lot softer. Worse on your knees, yeah. but softer yeah. to bump in. Uh, I don't. I, I never I, I never had that luxury when I was there. They were they were brutal. And like I said, the, the, the worst one was in Germany because here I am. You know, in Germany, um, Vader had gotten injured, and and uh, and uh, they asked him. Otto Vaughn said, "What American should I bring over to replace you?" And he goes, "There's only there's one guy I'm gonna give you. It's Eric Watts." So then he called he called. Um, he called uh, Ganya, Vern Ganya, because I had booked a show in December for Vern at a uh, 
Indian reservation, a casino. Yeah. And and it was like a month out. And so it was actually that same booking was the same as their big show. So in Germany and or, or catch, what they'll do is they'll go to a town and they'd be there like for like three weeks and they wrestle every night in the same arena. And, and there's a point system and it's how you win, how you win. And, and they got cards. It's the craziest shit I've ever seen. They got the, like, like, like football, yeah. they, they got green cards, red cards. And then if you're really good, you get the people mad. And, and like, like if you're a good, bad guy, the people will pay your fine so you don't get kicked out of the match. And then you split the fine with the good guys and the referees. Yeah. Right. And and so, so it's all, so I'm sitting there and all autos, like, you know, autos, like, uh, Bill Watts, son, I am very good friends with your father, you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, I'm flying over there. I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna get a day to see this. I've never seen the rounds. I don't know what the hell you guys are doing. You know, I, <laughs> Oh no, he goes, no, you're wrestling tonight. He goes, now this is very serious over here. It's not like America, you know. I'm like, okay, you know, Heil Hitler. I, you know, I didn't know what to say, right? You know, he was, and I don't know if you in the UK, right? But uh, was the circus ever big, like Ringling? Oh uh, yeah, bar? absolutely. I mean, oh brothers. yeah, for two hundred years, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so here I am, Fran Schumann, Dave Taylor, Fit Finley. I mean, this this court is set. Uh, uh, um, that's where I found. Um, that's where I found Kane. Uh, Glenn Jacobs was there. That uh, JBL was there. Uh, uh, Ice Train was there. So here's all these guys, right? And I don't know anybody hardly. You know, like ha ha ha. How you mm. doing? And they go, okay, Eric, we got to line up for the uh, beginning of the show. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, well, they, they bring the good guys out. They bring the bad guys out. They put them in the ring, and then they'll introduce you, and then one of the two guys will start getting into it and talk to each other and get in a fight and they'll break it up. And that's kind of how they start the show every time. Like, okay. And they're like, no, listen, you know, you're a good guy. So you being the good guy line. And, back, and so I'm like, you know, so I've heard all this shit. So I, I, I know this is going to be, okay, this is going to be intense, right? This is going to be intense. The music. That was the music they brought the guys to. I was like, what? <laughs> what? 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 I mean, like, is this a rib? What is Doink the Clown coming down? I tell you, it was hilarious. I was like, so they want to say it's all this and we're coming out to circus music. Well, <laughs> so I have not wrestled yet. And I'm in the ring. I'm like, this ring's pretty damn stiff. Well, it was actually a true boxing ring where they put a post up in the middle. Right. Well, see, I did not know. I was doing some high flying stuff. Like I was doing a, a reverse sunset flip off the top rope. I was, I, I was power bombing people into the turnbuckles. I was doing all shit. Jumping off the top rope with an elbow, I did not know you didn't do that there. And and then and then also I did not know when you body slam someone, you got to give them ten seconds to give up. I'm like, well, th-. so I body slam a guy. I start kicking, cards start coming out. I'm like, what? Are-? And I didn't know what the cards were. And so, but and, and all of a sudden the match stops. I'm like, what's going on? I didn't know there was intermissions or you know between rounds. So I go and the girl comes up with the water. I drink the water. People start laughing because I guess I was supposed to take it and spit it out like a boxer. <laughs> I, I, no, no, this, like, like no one gave me the handbook. I just flew in and wrestled. And I'm like, and so, so I, I drop an elbow. Well, they go, no, no, Eric, next time you drop an elbow, you slam the guy, just leave him for 10 seconds. They got to be able to get up on their own. If they don't, the match is over. Shit. I went to the top rope and jumped off the thing to give an elbow the first time. I hit and I go, dear God. I, I, I hit the bottom of a pool. It hurt so fucking bad. I was like, no wonder they need 10 seconds off. I said, <laughs> oh, my God, I, I needed 10 seconds to get up, and I'm the one that gave the guy the elbow off the top rope. It was the hardest. That ring was impossible, bro. That ring was impossible. Impossible. Oh, dude, I have I've so many more questions. for. I, honestly, I of the amount of questions I've written, I've got to so few of them as well. We have not even scratched the surface of what I wrote, let alone all the other stories you've got. You, If you ever fancy coming on for a, a part two or a part 78, because I've got enough questions, man, I tell you. <laughs> I, well, I'd hey, absolutely brother, love dude, to. That, that, that's what I was going to recommend, man. Now, now that your family, now that you, ha- now that you have my information, please feel free to send it to me. I, I Again, I, I try to give back, um, and, I, and, I, and I try to tell... Let, let me say this to your hundreds of thousands of listeners, okay? Because sometimes, uh, no, no, all the time, I, I have to make this very apparent when I speak on podcasts that the way I was raised in pro wrestling it, it is what it's what paid for 
everything, it paid for everything that's been in my life. And, and then I became a pro wrestler and it paid for everything in my kids' lives and my lifestyle. That's how important wrestling is to us. It's in our blood. It is us, right? But in today's world, okay, where WWE is gobbling up everything and then you've got a few other ones that are starting, what people do not understand is that wrestlers of the past need to do podcasts to get out to fresh audiences because you never know who's going to hear this. You, it may spark them. Who is Eric Watts? I'm going to look up some TNA. And then all of a sudden they're grabbing TNA. They're doing, all you are doing, all you are doing is you're a historian. And you are keeping wrestling alive with those that know it. And you're bringing it to life for those that don't. And without people like you, wrestling will die. We have to have these storytellers. We have to have them. So for me to come on a show like yours is not is not doing a favor like, oh, Eric, I can't believe Eric Watts is on my show. Let me say this. I cannot believe that you took the time to reach out to me, to ask me to be on a show to where I can tell stories, to try to help entertain people and keep wrestling alive. I am the one that is so thankful for you, your people, your show, and your fans. And it's a complete honor. And with that being said, anytime you want me on, even though my schedule is somewhat tight, you reach out to me and it would it would be my pleasure to be back on your show. That is very kind of you. Before I let you go, we were both talking about how we're social media, not as savvy as maybe we both could be, but you've got yeah. a Twitter. Yeah. Anything else you want to throw out there? Any plugs you want to get out now's the time? <sighs> I, I, you know, I've got Twitter, I've got Instagram. I don't even know what the hell the names are. My daughter laughs at me all the time. Um, I've got my Facebook. I think some people have just changed them because the the new thing is to have like Eric Watts official or official Eric Watts. You know, they're, you know, I did not even know this. Someone told me that the AI that Google does, right? You know, a lot, when I first started doing it, I put the real Eric Watts. Well, they said, well, what the problem is if you don't understand search engines. You'll put in Eric Watts, and it'll be way down because it's going to get the and real and da 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 da. You're going to be way down. So now I went and started changing my stuff to Eric Watts official or Eric Watts the real, you know, and, yeah. and doing. So I'm learning as we go. I, I hate it because I haven't learned enough. My kids know it very. They they know it very well. They have got a kajillion followers. Um, I need to get better at it. But yeah, I and and I'm maxed out all the time on Facebook on people i can allow on there because you can only have like five thousand people unless i open a commercial account so i'm looking at that so yeah anyone that does it but it but please if your fans hit me up on facebook and for some reason i don't accept their request it's because i'm an idiot and i don't <laughs> go on I, I i don't i i don't go on facebook all the time uh, i don't go do messenger often once in a blue moon and then I get all these hate mails like, why didn't you accept me? Why you accept me? And literally what I got to do most of the time is go delete like 100 people and then let 100 people in every so often. So uh, I would love for people to follow me. I'd love for people to see what's going on. Most of the time, all my stuff, I'm just posting about my son or my daughter or, or go, going to a nice restaurant or visiting a nice town. That's basically all I do, you know, on that. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll get, I'll figure it out. I'll get the Twitter, I'll get the Instagram, I'll put it on the screen for everybody and all these clips and that type of thing. And hopefully we'll get some uh, more followers. And then as we were discussing, you never know sometime in the future, you know, Mark Mayer is doing it, DDP's doing it, monetize that stuff a little bit and go from there. But for now, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you next time. And I will catch you again for a part two if you're up for it, man. Let's do it, my brother. God bless.